to the Cairo Business Mojo Podcast, where we deconstruct the methods, marketing, and mindset of successful business people and chiropractors from around the world. And now your host, Dr. Richard Day. Dr. John Minardi earned a Bachelor of Human Kinetics degree honors movement science from the University of Windsor and a Doctor of Chiropractic degree from the Canadian Memorial Chiropractic College. He's the creator, founder, and head instructor of the Thompson Technique Seminar Series and author of the complete Thompson textbook, Minardi Integrated Systems, the most extensive seminar series and textbook ever created for the technique. In addition, Dr. Minardi's primary interest has been to understand the neurology of the VSC. Dr. John brings a unique blend of passion, intensity, and excellent teaching skills in order to explain, in a practical manner, the VSC's segmental and global neurological effects that occur in the body. In 2011, Dr. Minardi was named Chiropractor of the Year, an honor awarded to him by Parker Chiropractic Seminars. In addition to his busy lecture schedule, Dr. Minardi operates a full-time practice in Oakville, Ontario. Welcome, Dr. John Minardi. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, thank you for coming on the show. Feel free to jump in there and fill in any gaps I may have missed in your bio. You know, I, I think it's pretty. Uh, I think that's pretty extensive. Uh, I mean, the thing I'm most proud of, I believe, is, is that I'm still a practicing chiropractor. A lot of people uh, teach in our great profession, but then um, fall short on on practice. Uh, you know, and I've I've been teaching on average of uh, 30 to 40 times per year and then but still maintaining full-time practice uh so i always believe that you have to be in the trenches to 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 be able to educate chiropractors properly so uh you know other than that i think i think the bio is pretty clear <laughs> well let's stick with that subject just a minute how has practice changed really in the last five to ten years would you say Oh man, you know, it's, uh, it, it's, it's a gigantic change. I've been in practice for 16 years now, and in the past five to six years, uh, you see a, a, a vast majority of, uh, the, the, like, for example, the way to, um, get new patients into the office is very, very different. Uh, uh, it, it, like say 10 years ago, uh, if we did a health screening somewhere, uh, there was massive, massive interest in that and, and a lot of people would come over to, to talk to you or at least get a screening or, you know, perhaps want to do a more extensive examination in your clinic. Uh, but because of the popularity of, uh, the internet and, uh, um, you know, the social media, uh, people People, uh, people are not as, um, uh, I was going to say, they're not as open to doing those as they are because Google is just a lot easier. So, so to click a couple of clicks on the computer, um, it is probably the most preferred method of, of, um, of getting, getting people, uh, you know, to, to, to get to your clinic and have a conversation with you about chiropractic, whereas, uh, you know, impersonal screenings before were by far, the, by far the biggest thing. Uh, so that's changed the most, I believe. Yeah, that is a huge sea change that, that has happened, especially the advent of the mobile devices, because now it may not even be at a desktop. It can be, you know, someone's in pain and they're at a stoplight and they're going to Google you and figure out where to go. Right, right. Just a completely different shift than it was before, that's for sure. Well, let's talk a bit about Minardi Education. Tell us about that. Uh, well, Minardi Education came to be as, um, in my opinion, a need for the profession because what was happening was I was I was noticing a very big trend in that chiropractors were starting to doubt um, what they were doing and they were not as certain in the power of the adjustment. Uh, as, as they were because people were questioning more. And see, back in the day, it was just enough to be certain. And you're like, you know, chiropractic works and that's it. And people were like, great. But because of the advent of Google and all this stuff, like, like you said earlier, people can literally look up everything on their phone in seconds. So what was happening, in my opinion, was a lot of people were questioning chiropractors on, well, tell me how this works and tell me how chiropractic does help the immune system if you, if you claim that or tell me how chiropractic does do this and do that. And I think a lot of people uh, were caught off guard because they really didn't know. And the only explanation that they had was the classic, um, you know, pressure on nerve uh, theory, uh, which is, is not accurate. Uh, so, so, the, so the problem was is people were getting a little tongue-tied, and, and because of that, they were starting to lose a lot of certainty in what we did. And 
and and you know our our um, market was flooded with you know chiropractic is good with back pain chiropractic is good with neck pain and I think that people were just starting to believe only that and and I knew that we were just so much more than that so I started to create courses to show people the physiology and neurology behind what we did as a practicing chiropractor. I I mean, I have to make this completely clear. I'm not a neurologist in any capacity. Everything I've taught, I've taught to myself. And uh, I think that's important to know because I'm always coming from it as a practicing chiropractor because I I wanted to be able to explain this complex stuff to a patient that might not have the education uh, that would understand all the complex terminology and the pathways and all that stuff. So I had to break it down into um, spoon-sized chunks so that, number one, I could understand it properly and explain it simply to someone else and so that they could understand it. So that's where minority education came to be. I I started to break down the body um, into what I would call essential components for people to explain to their patients. So like, you know, how the subluxation affects the immune system or the power of the adjustment itself and what it does to the brain and how it affects uh, pregnancy and, you know, fetal development and all of these things that we see day-to-day in our offices and everybody's experienced phenomenal results with it but maybe had a hard time explaining why or wanted to understand more of why that was happening in their office. Uh, that's, um, that's where it all originated. It just kind of blew up from there. Well, my last real, I guess, formal education um, on the subluxation was uh, in school and exposure to Dr. Dan Murphy. I'm sure you've heard of him and his work. Sure. Um, yeah, and he, for sure. And he really broke it down for me. But it has been a while. It's touched upon a little bit in some of the continuing education classes uh, that I go to. But do us a favor for myself and the listeners. Briefly take us through the science of the v- VSC and how you explain it to docs. Sure. Um, you know, it's uh, the, the simplest thing that I like people to really understand and what I had to understand is that when someone is subluxated, it causes a stress response to occur in the brain. So the subluxation is a stressor. And, and we have to understand that every time someone subluxated, it has a negative effect on the brain. And every time we adjust them, we have a positive effect on the brain. So every time you're subluxated, there's two types of stressors that, that um, send bad information to the brain. And number one, it's a physical stressor because of all the distortion on the supporting structures, things like the disc and the facet and the muscle and the tendon and ligaments and all these things. When the subluxation is present, it distorts all those supporting structures. So bad information starts to get sent to the brain. The other type of stressor that it is, it's a chemical stressor because of the amount of inflammation that starts to build uh, within the joints and and, and, uh, surrounding areas because of the subluxation. So it sends uh, negative chemical information going to the brain. Well, that starts to create a stress response. Well, what is a stress response? A stress response is that the brain clicks on a couple of systems that send a massive amount of stress hormones into the body. Now, short term, these stress hormones help us. They get us out of a bad situation. You know, people have heard of the term fight or flight, right? Like if I had a gun to your head and I said, you know, you have to run from me and you only have 10 seconds or I'm going to start shooting, uh, you know, you need stress hormones to get you out of that bad situation. So short term, the stress response is actually a good innate response to the body. Uh, The problem is long term. So if the stressor doesn't go away, this is a big problem because now those same stress hormones that save you in a short-term situation, they really start to harm you because they start to shut down major aspects of the body that you need for health. So, for example, aspects of the immune system start to get shut down, aspects of the reproductive system start to get shut down, and aspects of the GI system start to get shut down. And the reason it shuts aspects of these things down is because it wants to send blood flow to muscles and heart and brain so that if you did have to run or fight somebody in front of you, you need need blood flow in those tissues. Now, short term, that's a good deal. The long term, those same stress hormones harm you very badly. And the stress hormones I'm talking about are adrenaline and cortisol. Like those short term are great. The long term, the long term release of adrenaline, the long term release of cortisol start to affect a multitude of other hormones in the body. And long term, that's what leads to disease and illness. And and, uh, the biggest thing I, I had to learn and I try to pass on to anybody that I that I come into contact with that are chiropractors is that every time 
time you're subluxated, you have a negative effect on the brain. You know, and every time you adjust people, it's that positive effect on the brain and the way that you help recalibrate the brain and release hormones, that is what's allowing the body to heal. You know, people are, you know, getting pregnant under chiropractic care where they never got pregnant before, not because L1 hooks up to the uterus. It's because every time you adjust the spine, you change the information going to the brain and recalibrate the hormones. So now you take blood flow away from the muscles and, and the heart and you bring it back to the reproductive system, back to the immune system, back to the GI system. So it allows the body to function at a much better level. So that in a nutshell is what's going on. I mean, there's obviously a lot more detail to it, but that's the basic premise that, that we all have to understand right off the top. So as a practicing chiropractor, I'm sure this you run into this as, as well, and this is short attention spans of our patients. What you just explained to me makes sense given my background and education, but I oftentimes find that when I'm communicating a message that has too many sequences or big words, that it sure. gets lost in translation and people aren't really dialing in. So how would you take that same thing you just told me using doctor words and, and let's get it down to where the public can consume it and really grab a hold and own what it is we're talking about. Yeah, absolutely. Like I always say to people, every time that you're subluxated, uh, the brain's not working properly. And every time we adjust you, we're going to help your brain work properly so that the right hormones and the good hormones can be released into your body. And that's it in a nutshell. And that's an easy message to communicate right there. Um, well, let me ask you this. Now, I assume that um, I've looked at your site, and there appears to be a lot of good research there. What's really come out in the last year or so? Can you? Is there anything that's exciting you that's really backing up what we do? Oh, for sure. There's a lot of a lot of great stuff out there. I mean, uh, a couple of things is uh, Dr. Heidi Havoc uh, and her team have come out with new research that that literally just got published in the journal Neuroplasticity a couple of months ago in in um, 2016, and they're showing that every time that you adjust the spine, you increase activity in the prefrontal cortex of the brain by 55 percent. Wow. So. Like, that is gigantic, and especially if you think of what's going on with the prefrontal cortex, and that's, you know, the higher learning stuff, the neocortex, all the stuff that, you know, conscious thought, all of this stuff. So the thing is, is who knows what the potential is for chiropractic? Uh, the one the one thing that cannot be argued at all now is that chiropractic does not affect the brain. See, before people, if, if I'd say something like, hey, when you're subluxated, it's, it's bad for the brain, people are like, well, how do you know that? So the thing is, is it was more of a theory. Now that, that there's absolutely no theory anymore, it is proven. And if I'm not mistaken, Dr. Havoc has reproduced uh, those similar findings uh, two or three times. So this is not a fluke. You know, like this is uh, definitely happening to the brain. And in 2014, Plaza did another great study where they adjusted people and they looked at the release of a, of a very good hormone called oxytocin and seeing how that gets released from the brain, if at all, with a chiropractic adjustment. And they found that when you adjust people, that the amount of oxytocin gets released from the brain increases. You know, so, I mean, the whole the whole thing, you know, where I was theorizing this based on fun functional physiology, now the research is showing that. But the, the thing that I really want the listeners to understand is this has always happened with chiropractic, always, always, ever since the very first adjustment. But the thing is, is it's only now that the research is able to look at this a lot more. And, you know, things like O'Gara study in 2011 where they put people in a PET scan, like they literally had people, his brain in a PET scan while they adjusted them. And then they found the activity and the stress area of the brain decreased and the activity again in the prefrontal cortex increased when you adjusted them. Wow. You know, so it's gigantic. And that's why, like, I believe as a profession, we really need to understand this research and help support and fund any similar research to this, because this is the only way we really start to see how powerful we are and, and, and get way out of the dinosaur age that all we do is back pain and neck pain and all that kind of stuff. Like, that's a very, very small piece of the puzzle, in my, in my opinion. The biggest thing that we 
have is on the brain. The biggest effect we have is on the brain. And now the research is, is looking more and more into that. So I would suspect we're going to see a lot more research in that area in, in the upcoming years. But in the past couple of years, that's what's been going on. So pretty awesome in my opinion. Yeah, definitely. I think we're living in, in an exciting time where we have the technology to really measure those things that are going on in the body and sort of clear up the mystery about what we do. I know, speaking for myself, if I understand it backwards and forwards, I'm better, even if I'm simplifying things for my patients, I really have a firm foundation of understanding to come from. And I'm excited by the things you're telling me and the work that you're doing to spread that message. I appreciate that, brother. Well, let me, uh, let me ask you this. So I was looking on the, on your website, just some of the topics that you explore. And maybe for chiropractors who have forgotten this or, or need to hear it again, what are some of the ways the subluxation can affect ADHD, brain adaptation, pregnancy, that sort of thing? I was very intrigued right. by that. Yeah, I mean, like, the thing is, is like, uh, you know, uh, like I was just saying, we, we really have to understand what's going on with the brain and how it adapts and, and all that kind of stuff. And a lot of people uh, in their offices right now, I'm sure they've had uh, indiv- individual children who have been diagnosed with some type of behavioral issue, whether it be ADHD or, or whatever, and they get these people much better. And all they're doing is adjusting them, and oftentimes the parents and the teachers say, I don't even know what's going on, but don't change what you're doing. And the only thing they've changed is gone to a chiropractor. And, and a lot of times the chiropractor's like, this is great, you know, but if you ask them, why do you think that's going on, oftentimes they're like, I really don't know. Like, I'm sure I'm affecting the nervous system somehow, but I, I don't exactly know what's going on. And w- what we have to remember is that, one of the big things that, that that we affect is that release of cortisol. And they have found with ADHD-type behavior that there's an issue um, with, well, the theory is that there's an issue with dopamine. And that's why all of the drugs that are out there try to target a bigger release of dopamine. So things like um, Adderall and Ritalin and these type of things, uh, th- their goal is to stimulate the release of more dopamine in the brain. And, and the reason that they're trying to stimulate that is because one of the roles of dopamine is to increase concentration. That's one of its roles. So, um, and so that's why they try to hammer it with the drugs. But if you continue to do research on that, you'll find that uh, dopamine is actually not the problem. What the problem is, or, or I should say dopamine release is not the problem. It's not that the receptor in the brain can't release dopamine. That's actually not the problem. The problem is the more cortisol that is in the blood, it sends a signal to dopamine to stop being released. Mm. So if you have tremendous amounts of the stress hormone cortisol in the blood, that decreases dopamine. Now, don't get me wrong. It doesn't decrease it to zero. Like sometimes people think like there's no dopamine in their body. That's not true. But remember to be healthy, to have, a, you have to have the right amount of dopamine. Too little is no good. Too much is no good. You have to have the right amount. So what ends up happening is if they, if you have too much cortisol, too much of that stress hormone, you decrease dopamine. And another major thing with dopamine when you have too little of it is that you lose controlled movement. So for example, if you've ever seen a Parkinson's patient, they constantly have an arm that's shaking on one side. Mm -hmm. That's a lack of dopamine that they have in the brain, releasing from the brain. Well, think about that. If, If I was a little kid and I'm moving all the time and I got ants in my pants and I can't sit in my seat, that's a lack of dopamine. So they label the individual with ADHD. But if you can hammer them with all these drugs, that's only going to be a very short-term fix as long as that stress hormone cortisol is in their blood. See, they did studies on rats where they, they removed cortisol from the blood and they theorized that if cortisol really does have an effect on dopamine and then behavior, that if I remove cortisol, I should immediately see an increase in dopamine and the behavior should be completely uh, taken care of. And that's exactly what they found. They took out cortisol and they had an immediate immediate increase in dopamine and the behavioral issues in this in these um, in these rats completely dissolved 
as wow. soon as they remove cortisol. So the thing is, is that what I like to tell people is that by, you see, that's why we start off with the stress response. Because once you understand how powerful that is and how that hormone cortisol affects a multitude of other hormones, well, then that'll end up affecting behavior. So the thing is, is that these kids that are running around and, you know, have ants in their pants and they can't sit still and they blurt out answers and stuff like that, these, these, these kids don't have a brain injury per se, what they have is bad communication going to the brain. So if we can adjust them, decrease that cortisol in the blood, then we help regulate that dopamine. And if you can help regulate that dopamine, then you can have those behavioral issues start to change, which is why so many chiropractors see that in their practice over and over again. So so, so that's the thing. We, we just have to really understand that when we're adjusting these people and we're helping that brain adapt and we help uh, cortisol start to decrease, I mean, this is where we start to have tremendous effects. And you had mentioned one of my other courses on brain adaptation. Uh, one of the things I like to really teach in that particular course is the um, – extremely important influence of cerebral spinal fluid and a lot of people uh, know of cerebral spinal fluid as you know it, it gives nourishment to the to the nervous system and prevents shock and that's all true but in my opinion the most important thing about cerebral spinal fluid is that it helps wash the waste out of the brain see the brain is is obviously working all the time, and it uses 20% of the energy of the overall body. So when you use that much energy, there's going to be some type of waste that's produced, and usually it's in a chemical form in the brain. Well, guess what? If you don't have something clearing that waste out of there, which is cerebral spinal fluid, in my opinion, that's where you start to get these like scarrings or plaques or, or any of these things that's happening inside the brain. Well, the cool thing is, and your listeners can go right on YouTube right now and, and watch uh, a cerebral Cerebral spinal fluid, they have this on YouTube where it's, they show cerebral spinal fluid moving when the person is subluxating. It's a very slow movement. And then right after the adjustment, they show another um, uh, uh, visual image of cerebral spinal fluid, and the flow is tre tremendously different. And this is hmm. why I like to tell people of the importance of the upper cervical adjustments and the sacral adjustments because this is – these are the two main areas that assist with cerebral spinal fluid flow, you know, and, and there's a, actually an awesome new, um, I don't know if you guys, if, uh, you guys like sports documentaries or anything like that, but yeah. ESPN has a documentaries series called 30 for 30. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of that before, but it's phenomenal. And they talk about all these different things. Well, they came up with a new one that was called the 85 Bears, and it was about the Chicago Bears. And uh, the quarterback, McMahon, at the time, he always, at this point in time, he always felt foggy, and he felt like his brain was not functioning properly, and he was afraid that he was getting early dementia. I mean, this is a gentleman who's probably in his maybe 50s. He's not, he's not 90, you mm -hmm. know? And um, so anyways, all the people looked at all the scans on his brain and all this stuff, and they're like, well, you just had too many concussions, uh, nothing you can do about it, you know, just do puzzles and whatever and then he saw a chiropractor and the chiropractor looked below the brain and looked in his upper C spine and noticed that he had a lack of cerebral spinal fluid flowing in that area and they provided their adjustment and uh, McMahon's in his own words in the in this documentary said it felt like the toilet bowl flushed like he felt like clear for the first time in how many years you know, and this yeah. was the cerebral spinal fluid flowing, you know, so that's why I like to teach uh, our fellow chiropractors about the power of this because, you know, you, obviously we've all heard of cerebral spinal fluid, you know, back in chiropractic college, but I don't know any of, if any of us really understood the role we have in affecting that flow. You know, so things like that are what I really like to educate uh, uh, on people because think about it, right? If chiropractors weren't looking into this, then this poor guy would still always feel foggy. He yeah. still always feel like he can't concentrate properly. Now, I think you and your and your listeners would agree that would that changes somebody's life now. Huge. You know what I mean? Like, if, right? Like, if you wake up every day and you're like, I feel uh, uneasy, I feel unsteady, I feel like a fog all the time. Like, you don't feel like yourself, especially when you used to be a professional athlete. You must feel like garbage. And then all of a sudden, when someone adjusts you, 
And, and, and in your own words, you say it's what feels like the toilet bowl flushed. Like all of a sudden you've got this big clarity that just changed his, it changed, changed his whole life. Yeah. You know, so, so, so that's the thing. That's why I like to do these courses and show people the science behind it in a, in a practical way so that they understand how they affect it. Because, I mean, the last thing I do is go through all these neurological tracks and stuff because it, truthfully, a lot of that's useless information unless you can apply it. Right, so so that's why we try to make every course that we do extremely applicable, so people can understand, you know, what what they do with their patients every day. Well, that is great stuff, and I love the way you've connected the dots. And really, for the for the patient, for the for the average consumer or the public, the beauty of what we do is that everything you said that we can do and and affect change in the body is drug free, surgery free. I mean, you know, exactly. we do it with our hands. What a beautiful thing! Exactly. Exactly. Well, and I'm going to segue into, you know, we do such amazing work, but all the latest statistics I see, and I've really seen this for years, is that 15% or less of the public is utilizing chiropractic. Why do you think that is? Oh, my friend, I mean, the theories are out there, right? But, (laughs) like, I, I, I firmly believe that uh, it's a combination of a lot of things and I think it I think it, you know even back in the day uh, when the medical profession really tried to abolish chiropractic I think that they really put a lot of negative uh, even though it was inaccurate I, I believe they put a lot of negative information out there that scared people on chiropractic and uh and i think that that stays in people because i mean man i actually just had a conversation with someone a couple weeks ago and and they asked me what i did and i said oh, i'm a chiropractor and they're like oh my god a chiropractor don't you guys kill people i mean that that's that's still going on today you know what i mean so like it's so you can tell that negative connotation is out there. And uh, so I think that's a part of it. Uh, I think the other part of it is um, uh, like, well, I can only speak about Canada because that's where I live. But in Canada, uh, the, the, the medical, medical model is supported out here in the fact that if I went to the hospital right now for any reason, and I don't care if it's for a toenail, a back pain, a seizure, whatever it is, uh, everything is covered under our uh, provincial health plan. So we pay high taxes out here, but if you went to the hospital for whatever reason, it's covered. Whereas in a uh, chiropractic office, people pay out of pocket for that. Mm-hmm. So because of that, people don't realize that when they went to the medical doctor visit for whatever they went for, um, it actually costed our our taxes hundreds of dollars, but they, they did not see that, right? right? Whereas they do see the, you know, $45 coming out of their pocket going to a chiropractor. So I think there's a financial aspect of it until they understand the value. See, that's the big thing. And I think our profession has, uh, has had a hard time educating the public on the value of chiropractic care. And in my opinion, we will never be able to educate on that value if all we're looking at is things like back pain, neck pain, et cetera. No, get me wrong. Like, I know that back pain and neck pain can be debilitating for some people, and you can change their lives just by getting rid of pain. I, I, don't get me wrong. I am not trying to minimize that. But it is minimal in comparison to what we do to the brain in comparison to how we can affect the overall health of someone. And I really think um, I really think if we had the money, I really think the overall campaign we should push for chiropractic is that it is essential for overall health, no different than eating properly, no different than regular exercise, no different than thinking positively. These things are are essential for a healthy life and we really need to put chiropractic on that and if if we hit people more with that and educating them on that i think that more more than that 15 percent uh would be taking chiropractic uh you know much more seriously and saying you know what uh you need to have a chiropractor very similar to you need to have a dentist or whoever uh, whatever other health professional that you have uh you know it's it, it's unfortunate, but um, you know that that's that's what I believe we have to do. And because we don't have a big money 
backing like the pharmaceutical industries, uh, because we don't have that, uh, we have to do it on a more grassroots level, individually in our offices or as a community, and then, you know, as a state, and then just continue on from there. But it has to start with us in, in our practices. And that ties in perfectly to what I want to talk about next. The purpose of this podcast is to really educate chiropractors on how they can be more successful in business. A chiropractor that is out of business can't help anyone. Um, so right. we want to get people out there, and, and thank you for your help in, in getting a, a good message for us to spread. With that in mind, what is what are some action steps that chiropractors can take, either chiropractors who are in practice now or who are soon to be in practice? What are things they can do tomorrow to start improving their practice and getting the message out there? Um, the very first thing I can recommend is um, schedule a health talk. Uh, ha- have it so that your practice members start to really realize what chiropractic does and have them invite one person who is not currently in the practice. So, if you know, I don't care how many people you see, but let's pretend you have 20 people come to your health talk. Have them all bring one person who is not currently in your practice and then educate them on why it's so important for them to be under chiropractic care. That you have to do that. And, and the biggest, I used to, at the very beginning of my practice, I used to do that all the time. And at my very first health talk, I had two people and one of them was my CA, you know, <laughs> but, the, but, the, but, the, but the thing was it grew. And it grew and it grew and it grew and, and, and after a while it, it got to the point where that was the only way I could really educate people on what we did is if I took the time and put together a 20 minute health talk so that people could see the true value of chiropractic. Uh, someone said to me a lot, uh, asked me a long time ago, they're like, you know, give me your 30 second elevator speech on, you know, a chiropractic or whatever. And I said, honestly, I would use every one of those seconds to get people to my talk you know and uh and uh you know i stole that from um i stole that from reggie gold because I, I had read that reggie gold said that one day and he was 100 percent right it is very difficult for us to explain the power of chiropractic in 30 seconds you know it's just it's just very difficult but if you have 20 minutes and you're able to have a PowerPoint presentation and you're able, you know, to create an environment where people see what's going on. That's the best thing that I, that the best advice I can give people is to do it at least once a month and have it like clockwork, like rain or shine, you know, Thursday night, second Thursday of the month, you know, from seven to seven thirty. You're having your health talk and, uh, you know, change up the topics, but always make sure that you incorporate how chiropractic is involved in that. And, um, that's the best way people can start to really get more, more practice members in. And if you're starting out, I mean, you've got nothing but time on your hands anyway. So you, you should definitely be doing this. Great advice. And definitely helps to build a, a personal brand, establish a trust relationship, and build value in what you do as a practitioner because those sorts of things we don't charge for. People come to them, and you're getting out free information that otherwise is, is maybe hard to find, I, I think. Not a lot of people are talking about the things we're talking about. Right, exactly, exactly. Well, you've had a lot of success over the years, Dr. Minardi, and that's part of why we're talking to you today. And so I want to step back and talk about the bigger picture of really – one of the things we do on the, the podcast is deconstruct what successful people do. And so before we get there, though, in your mind, what's the biggest failure you've had? Um, all of us who have had some success, we've learned a lot, but we tend to learn even more from failure. Do you mind sharing? Oh, no problem. I mean, man, we can talk about this all day. I've had so many failures, that that's for sure. Um, I don't believe you can be successful without failing multiple times. You know, and uh, the, 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 what sucks is that they all hurt. Yeah. You know, there's never a failure where you sit back and go, oh, that was good for me. <laughs> you know, like, it, it, it sucks. Like, while you're going through it, you think the world is ending. Yeah. You know what I mean? Now, a year later or two years later, you might think to yourself, you know what? That was actually the best thing that could have happened. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? But during... You're thinking, holy cow, this is not good at all. 
you know, and, uh, uh, one of the, one of the bigger ones really, uh, you know, it's, it's even on my, in my personal life is like when I got separated from my ex-wife a couple of years ago, uh, you know, I don't know how the laws in, are in the United States, but I'm sure that they're very similar in that, you know, you, you spend a whole life, uh, building, uh, building your own personal little, uh, kingdom and fortress and all that kind of stuff. And, uh, when you split from your significant other, uh, you lose half of it right right away mm-hmm. you know what i mean and i don't care if you only have ten dollars to your name or ten thousand or ten million dollars to your name it's hard to lose half you know what i mean like it, it, it just is so you start to doubt yourself and you think holy cow i just lost this i you know my investments uh, how am i supposed to move on now i was supposed to reach these certain goals financially and i was on target for that and now i have to it feels like i'm starting over again uh you know so the, the thing is, is when I went through that, it was very difficult for me to see past it. And uh, I, I think that's the same for every failure I've ever had in business is that it, it, it's very difficult to see past it when you're in the middle of the storm, you know. But the best thing that I learned is just keep moving forward. Today, today is one day, but tomorrow is a totally new day and it can bring something completely different, you know. And uh, the one thing that I did, though, that kept me going is I did not remove the hard work that I was doing for my minority education stuff and for my seminars and at my practice. Like I could have, I could have like, you know, crawled up in a corner and been like, Oh, I'm having a hard time right now. So just you no know, one talk to me and forget about business. And some people do just that. They yeah. sit back and say, forget it. I'm not going to do anything for a while, but that's the worst thing you can do. Just keep plugging forward. It seems like the world is ending right now, but I assure you it's not. You just got to continue to do one thing per day. If you can accomplish one thing per day, I guarantee you, you are doing more than 95% of the world. If you can accomplish one thing every single day. So even when I was going through my hardest stuff, I literally said to myself, okay, yes, life sucks right now. What's the one thing I need to accomplish today? Just one. And I would list that. I would literally write it down on paper and I say, I need to get this done today. And once I accomplished that, I felt this, this, this feeling of, okay, good, good. I got that done. And it starts to rebuild your confidence again. It starts to show you that even in turmoil, you're still getting things done. You can, you know, if it's business, you can still make money. You can still come up with a product. You can still do something. You know, you don't have to fall apart completely. So that's, that's really it. And I really think I could give that advice to any of my failures is that no matter how hard it was, I always kept one foot forward, you know, one step again, another step again. If you can just do one little thing each day, it gets you out of the bad time and it brings you back to what made you successful to begin with. You know, so, uh, yeah, that, that, that's the best advice I can give. Well, thanks for sharing such a personal story. I can relate. I uh, have gone through a divorce myself, and around the time I began chiropractic school, my whole world was completely different. I was in a new city, didn't know a soul, um, and my marriage was breaking up at the same time. And, and part of what really kept me focused was, well, I had a purpose, and that was to go to chiropractic school, and there's not much time to really you know, <laughs> you know wallow. I had goals right, and things right. like that I had to fulfill. So very good advice. I appreciate you sharing that. My pleasure. So when you think of the word successful, who do, who or what do you think of and why? Man, I mean, success the definition is so different to other people, but, like, I always try to look at people who I idolized that I would, um, I would define as excellence or greatness, you know, and, and I always found that if you strove for excellence and greatness, money followed and everything else followed. If you're only focusing on cash, it's very difficult to be successful. It really, really is. 
Don't get me wrong. I'm a businessman, so money has to be there. Don't get me wrong. But I found that it has, it has to be your passion and it has to be what you love to do. And if you do that and chase it and give everything you have in it, I guarantee money follows that. I guarantee it. So I looked around, I looked at idols in my life, like, you know, like some, someone like Arnold Schwarzenegger. Right? And Arnold Schwarzenegger has a famous quote where he sat back and he says, I've never ever wanted to be a great bodybuilder. I wanted to be the greatest that ever lived. Mm. And to me, that quote summarized success, excellence, and the pursuit of success. It wasn't good enough just to be great. He pursued to be the best ever. And when you, when that's your pursuit, when you sit back and say, you know, I am not settling for anything but first place. When you have that mentality, I'm going to tell you something. Even if you don't reach it, you still get very far. You know what I mean? Yeah. So you, so, so to me, success is finding what you love to do, whatever it is. I don't even care what it is, but then being the very best at it and, and sacrificing everything until you get there. I mean, another big quote I love is from Muhammad Ali when he said, um, he said, I hated every minute of training. I hated it. I just suffered through it all. And he said, but I said to myself, suffer now and live the rest of your life like a champion. You know, and, yeah. and that's how I looked at it, right? Like, it, you know, being successful, I think everybody forgets the hard work that is involved with that. You know, like, please don't ever, for, for your listeners out there, like, please, I know that might seem like a basic fundamental, but I think it's overlooked too many times. People oftentimes will be like, oh, I just haven't caught a break. You know, I'm just waiting for my big break. You're going to wait forever. You know what I mean? Like you, you, you have to make your own breaks. You have to work so hard and do everything you possibly can. Uh, that that that's what brings you to success. You know, and and that's um and that's what I did. And so I, when I thought to myself, I'm like, I want to have a successful practice. I want to uh, you know travel around the entire world educating chiropractors. I want to have a I want to have businesses where we have uh, multiple areas of of getting that information out to people. And you just don't stop until you achieve it. You just do not stop. And once you achieve it, then you need to set another goal. You know, so yeah. you need to just do something, right? Like, um, yeah, like it, you, a lot of people dream big, you know, but everybody forgets you got to get up and do it. You know, like you, you, like you got to get up and do it because if you don't do it, it's not happening. You know, so, so that's it. Yeah, I think, you know, to, if I, if I can summarize a little bit, I, I've heard a couple of sayings lately, or at least one I can think of, and that's that success looks an awful lot like hard work. And I think, I uh, <laughs> and, and the other thing is that one of the ways I educate my patients is they come in for the chiropractic aspirin and, you know, boom, one adjustment and, and I'm fixed, right, doc? And my answer is, right. well, this is a process, not an event. And I think that's a great parallel to what you just said. Look, success is not an event. We didn't just flip the switch and become successful. This is an ongoing, active, get up, work hard every day process. And over time, you start to get a successful picture, just like Arnold Schwarzenegger right. did. Exactly. Exactly. Great advice. Well, uh, I've got some bad news to deliver, and that's that we're almost out of time. Um, All right. <laughs> so we have a few final thoughts. Um, do you have a favorite book you'd like to recommend to our listeners? Uh, favorite book? I got a couple for um, uh, for, for chiropractic. Uh, I would recommend everybody read two books. I would recommend everybody read uh, The Reality Check by Heidi Havoc, and I would also have them read uh, Well-Adjusted Babies from uh, Jennifer Barham for, uh, Floriani. I believe both of those books should be mandatory reading for every single chiropractor out there. And uh, as just my favorite book of all time uh, is um, uh, one from John Gershom called The King of Torts, and it's a great uh, book on what happens if we become too greedy and too selfish so to always stay humble you know great recommendations we'll put links to those in the show notes available on the website well what's the best business advice you've ever received uh best business advice i ever received oh man uh always spend less than you make love it 
You know, uh, so many people, they'll make a million dollars in a year, but if you're spending two million, you're still broke. Yes. You know, so, <laughs> so you always have to remember, man, the money coming in and the money coming out. Hold the money coming in, though, we've got to be more, you know? <laughs> I agree. And I think people forget that side of things. I, I'm not really interested in, uh, you know, what someone collected. What's their net value? What did they, you know, right. if they're, like you said, if they're outspending what they're collecting, it really doesn't matter. Uh, right. So what's the best way for people to contact you or find out more about Minority Education? Yeah, well, I mean, the best way is at our website, uh, minorityeducation.com. Uh, you, you can also go to our Thompson Chiropractic Technique uh, website as well, and uh, all of my websites have uh, contact uh, contact us buttons that come directly to us. Uh, so that's the best way to contact us. You can also uh, just Google my name, and you can see some of my videos for free on um, YouTube and all that kind of stuff. So, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of different ways to get me, that's for sure, but just literally Google my name, uh, hit contact us, and you're right with me. Well, Dr. Minardi, thank you so much for sharing some of your valuable time with us and our listeners today. I've really learned a lot, and I think uh, our listeners have as well. Thank you. My pleasure, brother. Thank you so much, and thanks for all the hard work you do to help uh, help build this great profession. You bet. Thanks for listening to the Cairo Business Mojo Podcast at www.cairobusinessmojo.com.